3D. Silent. Harvest. Strange Eons Radio presents the Amityville Horror Picture Show. That's Eric over there. Whoa, where am I? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm Kelly. We are your hosts on this uh, kind of weird journey of the Amityville films. Each episode, we're going to be bringing in a different guest host. And I'm so pleased to announce that today's guest host is the inimitable Anthony James K. Hi, Tony. Hello, gentlemen. I am delighted to be here. Can you take uh, 30 seconds and kind of brag about yourself and tell us what you're up to? <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, so my name is Tony Kay. I am a freelance writer in the Seattle area. Uh, at the moment, I'm writing for two different websites. One of them is called artisthome.org. It's a Pacific Northwest focused music website. And the other thing I'm writing for at the immediate moment is a website called thesunbreak.com, which is a film culture website also based out of Seattle. I also panel at Crypticon frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. that is how I met uh, these two gentlemen I'm sitting, uh, I'm sitting next to. And uh, I am absolutely chomping at the bit to talk about the Amityville horror. <laughs> you know, Tony, it's always <laughs> such a pleasure to see you. But I have to admit, Eric and I just saw you uh, a couple days ago. And yeah. I was like, am I going to be Tony'd out? <laughs> Guess what? I'm delighted to say that I love seeing you th as this morning just as much as I did oh my two God. days ago. Oh, so. my God. The Very romance true. is Very back true. in full bloom. I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me open this up with a little bit of information of what we're doing here. Uh, we are talking about the Amityville Horror, the picture show, <laughs> the movie that came out. It's the kind of house they don't build anymore. A relic of a time when the world wasn't in such a hurry. When there was still time for a little charm and elegance. It has stood empty for a long while. And at the price, it is a bargain. For a growing young family, it is almost too good to be true. What do you think? I love it. James Brolin, Margot Kidder, Rod Steiger, in the Amityville Horror. God's peace in this house. Kathy? Father Delaney, there's something very important. After the Lutz family moved into their dream house, they were running for their lives. What happened to them is an experience in terror you will never forget. And you will believe in the Amityville horror. From the best selling book that made millions believe in the unbelievable, the Amityville horror. And uh, the background on this is on November 13th, 1974, Ronald DeFeo Jr. shot and killed six members of his family at their house at 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville. He was convicted of second degree murder in November of 75. And in December of 75, George and Kathy Lutz and their three children moved into the house. Oh. 
After 28 days, the Lutzes left the house, claiming to have been terrorized by paranormal phenomena while living there. These events served as the basis for Jay Anson's 1977 novel, The Amityville Horror, which was then adapted into film in 1979. Now, the interesting thing about all of this, <clears throat> as Amityville is a real town and the stories of DeFeo and the Lutzes are historical... There is no proprietary relationship to the underlying story elements associated with the Amityville haunting. And so as a result of this, there have been no restriction on the exploitation of the story by film producers, which is the reason that most of these films share zero continuity, were produced <laughs> by different companies, and tell widely varying stories. When I, when I thought this would be a good idea for a podcast, I was thinking, you know, a a limited series that just ends when we get to the final Amityville film. Uh, as of this recording, there's about 30 films yeah. with the Amityville title in it, and nine of them have been made since 2019. Holy sheep shit. Jeez. But, you know, the high quality we're looking at in our future, of Amityville in space oh, and Karen. I have a bad. I have a bad feeling about this because I have skipped ahead <laughs> to some of these movies, you guys, and it is going to be uh, it's going to be a struggle. Yeah. Oh. Has there been an Amityville with sharks yet? Yes. Okay. Amityville thought, that's shark. what I thought. That's what I thought. Okay. Good. Good. <laughs> but that's that's a that's a spoiler for later in the run of the series. That's right. We'll start, we'll start from the beginning. Right. So. Um, just some quick background on this. The Amityville Horror, the movie, 1979, a budget of about $4.7 million and a worldwide box office of over $86 million. It is considered one of the highest grossing independent films of all time. It was American International Pictures that put that out. Uh, it was directed by Stuart Rosenberg, who directed Cool Hand Luke, Brubaker, 46 other films. And it was written by Sandor Stern, who has a long list of made-for-TV movies. And this, which makes sense because this was originally going to be a made-for-TV movie. Did you guys know that? I, you know, if I hadn't have heard that from you, I would have suspected it strongly because the <laughs> yeah. movie has that very kind of utilitarian flatness of a, of a made for TV movie. Yes. And it just, it just does. And it's oddly long for that. <laughs> time oh, I know. Frame. I, I mean, could... it's like, why is this movie two hours long? Man? Knives it's... out. Seems much longer. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. It stars James Brolin, Margo Kidder and Rod Steiger for some reason. Um, <laughs> I want to start every episode out this way. And since you're the guest, Tony, I'll ask you first, what is your Amityville horror origin story? How did you become aware of this thing? Um, I, I think you have to be in our general demographic to real, really realize what a big cultural yeah. deal this movie was. You mm -hmm. literally could not pass by a newsstand or a bookstore or a department store and not see like shelves and shelves of the Amityville horror paperback. It was uh, that, it, that iconic image of the house with those triangular windows uh, is it's, it's etched in popular culture for a reason. <laughs> it was, it was, it was everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, I never had a chance to read the book. Uh, I ended up going straight into the movie and I saw it when I was, uh, 12 years old, I think. No, I would have been 11. Um, and I saw it at a theater called the Parkland theater. And, um, I consider myself to be a bit of a doctor of schlockology, I guess. <laughs> um, and so the Parkland theater was my ground grindhouse slash genre university. And so I saw it there. Um, this was a theater that basically either ran, usually either ran second run, um, like a list features or w they did double features. And I started living in this area, which was Spanaway, Washington, about 10 miles South of Tacoma, uh, in 77. So I would have seen this about two years after moving into the house my parents bought, uh, it played as a single feature, which was kind of a rarity at the Parkland. Uh, if we had a single feature playing there, it was usually a second run, uh, like mainstream Hollywood movie, uh, or you would always get a package deal double feature. So this was kind of a special event movie by Parkland theater standards, uh, which, uh, which I, you, you kind of had sort of a, a hierarchy of crap when it came <laughs> to movies that you saw in rural Pierce County. Um, that's a whole other story because there's also the military theaters, which made the Parkland look like 
I don't know, Grauman's Chinese. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was a packed house. Uh, and I remember the movie making a strong impression on me there. And I'm sure we'll get into it. There are scenes in the movie that still, I think, on some visceral level work. Um, and the thing that I think stuck with me watching it the most at this point was what you just alluded to, which is that, um, that made for TV quality that it has. And I think for me, I found it kind of like it, it, it gave the movie a patina that actually, I think arguably made it scarier for me at the time, which is that it felt like, a made for TV movie. It felt like a bad reenactment from an old in search of episode. <laughs> and that patina of sort of verisimilitude, you know, sort of faked verisimilitude, <laughs> um, really gave it an air of that kind of unsettling, gee, did this really happen? Maybe this really happened, you know, but, but bum rushed by, you know, A-list actors. It's, it's a very, it's a very weird movie. I've watched it several times in prep for this. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Eric? Uh, mine is a little different. I don't remember when I actually saw it, but what Tony was talking about there with the original of the story and the way it was all over the place, it was a huge influence on me for horror in general. The concept, there's a, a group of films and their TV commercials, The Changeling, The Omen, and The Amityville Horror, that kind of all sit in the same place in my head of going, yeah. wow, this is like horrible forbidden stuff. Because I'm, I'm a little younger than you, Tony, so I wasn't old enough to see it or to convince my parents to take me to it, because neither of them were really horror fans. Um, but the omnipresence of it everywhere yeah. and the story captured my imagination because I'm like, holy shit, this is supposed to be a true story. And I don't know if you want me to tell you my full story about it now, you know, because it's definitely more the end of what happened with the Amityville Rush is what hit me the most. Oh, well, save that for the ending. Then. Okay. <laughs> but for the, the film itself and the legend around it, it all was around the idea that this was real. Oh, totally. And I, you know, I was probably still in single digits. So it hit. Very much like, ooh, because I, I love that shit. I oh, wanted yeah. to experience some paranormal thing as a kid. And uh, this seemed like my best opportunity, at least for the time, <laughs> for the early part of it, it did. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of there with you. Um, I was fascinated with shit like this. And I remember we had the book in the house. My, my mom had read it. It was the uh, black cover. It didn't. I don't think it had the picture of the house on the cover, but it, it did have the... It's like the, the glowing eye thing or something? No, it was a black cover. It just said the Amityville Horror and then... In that font, so though. With, with the devil tail coming off of one yes. of like okay, the Y yeah. or something like that. I yeah. can't remember exactly what it was, but I remember being terrified of it because we lived in kind of a old haunted house at the oh. time <laughs> uh, with a creepy basement and uh, it made weird noises and doors would creak open whenever it wanted to and shit like that. So I was kind of a scared kid mm. anyway. And, so, and and then I just surrounded myself with that shit. Um, I remember being taken to this in the theater by my sister and her, it was either her boyfriend or her husband. Um, you know, I would have been nine, I guess. Probably. Yeah. And, uh, I remember that I was like terrified coming sure. out of that, but, oh, yeah. uh, her boyfriend, we get out and he's like, uh, did I just spend $3 to watch a chair <laughs> rock by itself and see some <laughs> glowing Christmas lights outside of a window. <laughs> so not impressed. Yeah. Oh. He was, he was not impressed. You need to get him for the podcast. Man. <laughs> I tell you. I'm still, in, I'm still in very good touch with him. Uh, probably much better How relationship really? than my sister has with him at these <laughs> times. Um, <laughs> Okay, so the movie opens with uh, the DeFeo murders. Uh, I watched this movie just recently for the podcast as well, mm -hmm. and I thought to myself, this is a pretty chilling opening yeah. scene. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was really effective. Yeah, uh, and I, th I think the editing is... I, I think it's interesting, the editing that they do uh, where there's intercuts of just the shotgun fire and then, uh, oh, and here's the bedroom. Yeah. Da, da, da. yeah. I mean, it's it's not exactly the most innovative of like editorial slash filmmaking devices, but it worked, you know? Yeah, I love that uh, 
in the opening sequence, the shotgun is being blasted, but the thunder is also mm -hmm. crashing. So, yes. you know, there's kind of a uh, kind of an explanation why nobody would be waking up, I guess. Although I think it'd be hard to sleep yeah. through that storm, quite yes, honestly. Yeah. There, yes, there's thank. a little um, a little bit of the cat jumping out to the sound effects, but it all works really well. Sure. You know, it's just sort of a jump scares. But at that point in the film, that kind of jump scare doesn't bother me in a movie when it's used that well. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the music, I thought, at least at the beginning, I kind of like the opening credits music and the stuff that's going on with that. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily last through the whole movie. But, oh, I, uh... <laughs> you know, it's funny. I think that's part of the, the charm for me is the score, which is Lalo Schifrin, who did a lot of amazing stuff in the 70s. And it's equal parts brilliant and club you over the head, hammy and shit, <laughs> yes, you yeah. know? Um, you've got that uh, very creepy childlike theme, uh, but it's like swirled up with these earnest kind of heartwarming after special school yes. music type, uh, you know, <laughs> music motifs. And then you've got the psycho violin strings, you know, which come at like key points. In fact, I think they pop up when there's the cat jump scare and it's mm -hmm. like, ah! Yeah, <laughs> and I, I'm just thinking to myself, Rosenberg. I, I'm just picturing him as like this grumpy old man who's like, "All right, kids, you bunch of you bunch of scare, you bunch of jump scare. All right, here, here's a cat. There's a cat going hiss, meow. See, he's go he's gonna get you. Oh, you know. I just and it feels like I mean, there's 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 this there's this sort of like old prose vigor to a lot of the a lot of the scares that that. Uh, surface. It's not like super artful, but it's like, oh, the kids want some graphic violence. We'll throw it in here. <laughs> you know, it's uh, yeah. And and it is if, if very much. I mean, it's it's a 1979 era amusement park ride, roller coaster ride, you know, mm. as any, you know, competent, if not game changing horror movie of the time would have been. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a year after the murders take place is when George and Kathy Lutz tour the house. They're told about the murders, and then they make an offer of eighty thousand dollars on a house man. that we are told is worth at least <laughs> one hundred and twenty thousand. <laughs> that was so like, wow, man. <laughs> Eric, you've been looking for houses. What, uh -huh. what are you finding in the hundred twenty thousand range these days? Um, I'm guessing that. Some of the tents you see on the side of the sure. road now are those hundred thousand dollar units. Yeah, uh, I, I think you're probably probably right. Yeah. Oh, and, and then at one point she says, uh, Kidder's character says, "Might as well be eight hundred thousand." Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, eight hundred thousand, you lucky dog. Um, I'm dating someone who has been house shopping and just recently bought a house and paid more than eight hundred thousand yeah, dollars for it. Not Significantly hard to do. more in West Seattle. Well, listen to this, you guys. Yeah. The house is 5,000 square feet. It has five bedrooms, three and a half bad bathrooms, and a boathouse. And in 2017, it sold for 605,000 is all. Whoa. Really? Asking price was 850. Uh, I'm guessing that it still gets a lot of weirdo yeah. traffic, and that probably is knocking the yeah. price down. Well, I heard they uh, rearranged the those signature... Windows have been changed. Yeah, and they're the, just now oh, of regular. The pumpkin eye windows are yeah. gone. Yeah. yeah. Um, I got a question for you guys. Hmm. First of all, do you believe in the supernatural? I would. F oh, I, I mean, that's that's broad. Uh, do you believe in ghosts? I would frame it this way: in that I really want to. I I would agree. That's that's um, me. I'm all. Mulder, I, I'm, I'm largely Mulder on this. Yeah. I want to believe. I mean, I, you know, spiritually, I think of myself as an agnostic. I don't know what the hell there is out there. I would sure. like there to be something beyond this mortal coil. Um, I think it would be, you know, it's like Kurt Vonnegut said, you know, then at least we'd, you know, we'd know at the end what, what was the good news? What's the good news? Um, if anything. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I'm always open-minded to it. I, you know, I, I want more evidence, but yeah. uh, mm. I would like it to be there. Glowing orbs don't do it for you? Mm, not quite. Well, well, there was that time year, a few years ago, your uh, real estate agent friend yeah. was offered us to stay in a haunted house. No, or, we, uh, we tried to get her tried, to. Okay, yeah, that's what it was. She had a house oh, wow. that was supposedly haunted that she was trying to sell, and we were trying to get her to let us stay for a night and uh, film. Yeah. Right. That, um, they, that didn't okay, happen. but with that in mind then, what would it take for you guys to uh, to say no to a house, even if it was a screaming deal, six 
six people being murdered a year before, is that enough for you to go, eh, not for me? Uh, in Seattle, <laughs> no. <laughs> in Seattle, it would take a Jonestown massacre sized, um, you know, mass <laughs> grave to maybe. And then even then it would just be, oh, we'll knock $20,000 off because 600 people died here instead of <laughs> 20, you know, or whatever. Yeah. It's, yeah. 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 The, I'm only slightly joking on that. The idea of hanging around energy or something. I mean, if you're thinking there's a negative energy, then you also can think you can get rid of whatever that negative energy is. If that's the reason you're not wanting to buy it, do whatever you need to have that whatever ritual or whatever will make you feel that's gone. And then... Remember, it was just a house. <laughs> well, okay, so you're saying that now. Um, you're married. Mm -hmm. Your wife is okay with six I, people. I don't being know. Killed? If she, <laughs> she might have a very, very different, <laughs> very different approach. Because yeah, like you hear the. We don't live in anything remotely resembling a haunted place. You know, it's like a right. condo building, but you still get the weird noises. And we do have a weird crawl space above our place. And so every once in a while, she's like, oh, what's that? And where she's going, oh, oh, my God, what's happening? I'm like, oh, is there something cool? That, there's, <laughs> come on, bring me something. <laughs> let, let, me, let me see the cat staring at something on the wall. And I walk over there, and it's like 40 degrees cold, colder in this spot. Right. Or oh, good heavens. Anything like that. It's like, oh, that would be, that would be cool. <laughs> So, okay, uh, Kathy is religious, George is not, but... Um, but he changes he's, religions. <laughs> he's okay, though, <laughs> with her bringing in a priest to bless the house, and that priest is Rod Steiger, mm -hmm. clearly in need of rent money. Um, <laughs> he's awful in this, right? That's not just me. I, You know, there is something operatic in the badness of his <laughs> yes. performance. Yes. It's just... A, and I, you know, it, it's one of the things where I... Oh, what did I write in my notes? The Steiger ham is about to burst out of its can. I'm just waiting for it. Um, yeah, there's a point where you start to see the slow burn. It's not really very slow. Um, uh, or, you know, right immediately after he has the uh, the incident with the flies, where he goes to visit the house. He can't. The Lutzes aren't inside the house, uh, and then he has a visitation from flies and something that Get smells really. Out. Oh, and that's that's <laughs> another thing that actually stuck with me. It stuck with me from the trailers. It stuck with me from the movies is the intonation of get out. It's not get out. It's get out. <laughs> it's, it's like the first syllable is get and the last <laughs> syllable is tout. <laughs> but it works. It works. Yeah. So and then actually another thing that I was really just getting down to little things that work in the movie um, when he's in there and the flies start swarming uh, at one point. It goes completely silent, completely silent. And then you hear the voice go, get out. Yeah. And then it starts to build back up again. And I thought that was a nice yeah. little touch. It's it's a pretty effective scene, but let's it talk is. about this character because uh, he plays a major part in the book <laughs> and the movie. And then I've got some uh, some news at the end of this. Uh, we get the, um, the phone calls full of static. Right. Which I... I I'm not sure exactly what is what is going on here story wise. The evil follows him for whatever reason. Yeah, is like, it yeah. just because how um, and why? Is it just because he had the balls to bring his religion into this place and they're gonna make him suffer? Because that doesn't seem to be the case with anybody else. Right. It's hard to say. Um now I watched the MGM DVD from like 16 years ago or whatever, but it also has a commentary on it by Hans Holzer, who right. is a paranormal investigator who Ooh. actually investigated the real life Amityville case. And it's, it's very entertaining commentary because he goes through point by point as the movie's running and points out the areas where, okay, this is sort of the truth, kind of maybe a little <laughs> bit, but by 45 minutes into the movie to an hour, and it's an almost two hour long movie, yeah. he's basically like, this is bullshit. This is bullshit. I, I, this is Hollywood. <laughs> this is bullshit. This is bullshit. It's like, and it's just, it's amusing because every little, you know, progressively more operatic plot twist. Uh, and he's like, ah, that's Hollywood. And I'm like, yes, indeed it is. Yeah, well, <laughs> we're also given that scene towards the end of his storyline, the priest, uh, where he's in the church, the statue of Mary crumbles mm -hmm. and he goes mm -hmm. blind. Yeah. But the statue didn't crumble. And so... To me, I, I'm like, okay, 
was everything in his head? Was this whole thing just him going crazy coincidentally? Yeah, it's a strange deviation in the story that seems... It's a B story that isn't... It doesn't connect to the A story very much at all. Yeah. Once he's gone, he never really communicates with her again because it's always phone problem interference. I would not be surprised if it was some sort of weird budgetary limitation and they like were doing something to edit around the fact that they couldn't get Steiger and Margot Kidder and James Brolin in the same room at the same time. It almost feels like that because you don't really see a lot of them together. It, or do you at all? No, no and you except for the fact that that is part of the story in the actual book. Mm. I would think that this was a rewrite Yeah, that, ah. that had to be added in afterwards or something like that. We because get, it doesn't, it just doesn't fit. Right. We can get Rod Steiger in here. What's he going to do? Well, we don't know. We'll come up with some shit. <laughs> the, um, the acting moments you're talking about, the fly one's a little bit, a little over the top, but that final scene when the crumble and the... Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> it is so over the top and so big and so disconnected from anything going on in the house. It's not like they're flashbacking to the house and the house is shaking and reacting to his <laughs> prayers and something's going on. It's just all right here in his little world with him and this strange priest who starts out as kind of a creepy guy on the phone for whatever freaking reason right. and just follows him around but doesn't investigate anything. I'm not sure that, yeah, the whole priest element doesn't tie back into the house you, at all. You know, you say that, and I would have loved it to go back to the house and heard that ghostly voice chuckling yes. or something. <laughs> that would have been <laughs> Damn bright. right, you're blind. <laughs> I'm looking through my notes, and my one of my notes, it's just, the ham is unleashed. Yeah, <laughs> Steiger yeah. is off the fucking chain. <laughs> my favorite part, and this is, this is the scene where he actually is like, confessing this to um, the two superior priests, including <laughs> Murray Hamilton from fucking Jaws, basically yeah, being yeah. a doubting Thomas, although a more benign doubting Thomas and slightly <laughs> less cynical than the one he plays in uh, Jaws. Um, but Steiger has one of the greatest lines in cinema history when he goes, I am not some pink cheeked seminarian who doesn't know the difference between the supernatural and a bad clam. I am a paranormal or I am a psychological investigator or whatever the fuck. And it's like, and Murray Hamilton is right up there. Like, who do you think you are? And I'm just thinking, oh my God. These guys, you know, the fucking both cans of ham have been opened up and they are unleashed. It, I almost see like the director in the background, you know, if it was done now, he'd go, well, take it to 11 or give me the Nicolas Cage. Thank you. Because he just goes from relatively calm to Whoa! in like two seconds flat. Well, it's like, hey, hey, man, you were triggered. And what's, <laughs> and what's happened to trigger him? He goes into a house, it smells a little, and some flies collect on some shit including on him, you know, yeah. which, you know, maybe you should be thinking about your hygiene if flies are drawn to you like that. Um, I know it's all supernatural, man, 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 but... Speaking of the flies, did you guys come across the DP's problem with that scene? Yeah. Yeah, he's terrified of flies. So he would, <laughs> on the close-ups of the flies, he shut his eyes. He just pointed the camera and hoped that he oh got a good shot to get it. Oh my God. <laughs> like, wow. I love it. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Well, you know, the, and that's the thing. I mean, I, I, not to be grouchy old man, but this is, <laughs> this is something that CGI cannot do. Ah, CGI cool. cannot truly reproduce. I mean, one of the things that's actually pretty impressive to me is that Steiger is emoting with like progressively larger amounts of flies on him because he's actually got honey smeared on himself. Right. Right. And so, and so, you know, it's not the same if you have, like, a CGI fly crawling on somebody's skin. If you have a real fly crawling on somebody and you can see it's a real fly, it does make a difference. It oh, yeah. helps with the, the visceral impact of what you're seeing, I think. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I, I, was, yeah. uh, I was uncomfortable oh, with the fly on God his forehead. I, I was just like, ugh, yeah. gross. God, I know. You know. And he's just sort of standing there, and then he does that great Rod Steiger glower where he like whips around, he kind of looks over his shoulder, <laughs> and he's got like four or five flies clinging to one cheek, and then you hear the buzzing, and it's, it's genuinely unsettling. It is one of the better scenes yeah. in the film. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, so then when the, the nun comes... Th which is her sister. And I, I, yeah. I think I knew that it was her sister, but it felt like it finally clicked for me that this was her sister and they weren't 
just calling her sister. Yeah, yeah, um, I think so too. Yes, yes, she shows up, gets very ill, also drives away. Now, this is one of the very strong memories I have from being in the theater because she pulls over and she opens the door and she vomits, and <laughs> some wisecracker in the back of the theater goes, uh, "She must have just eaten at McDonald's," <laughs> and everybody just lost it in the theater. <laughs> I must say, say she hurls well. I was like, I you know, I was watching it this time around. I was thinking, you know. That's a very convincing hurl because sometimes you just get like, you know, Who? you'll get an actor will just like cough. Sure. She'll cough. And it's like, no, this person isn't Ralphing. They're just coughing. And she's like, she's got her gut into it. It's great. Yeah. Do you think, so at the opening scene, we get the shot of the uh, police officer mm -hmm. who's, um, who's there investigating the murders. And then we've got Rod Steiger here. It almost feels like they were thinking The Exorcist. We need a we need a grizzled detective, oh. and we need a priest to come yeah. in here to to really nail home this this satanic thing we got going on. And speaking of that, this was just prior to the satanic panic, but I can't help but think that maybe this kind of started the satanic panic because this was all over the news. There were multiple evenings where the, you know, before it was a movie, they were talking to the Lutzes and all this stuff. And it really kind of uh, put in our minds that, you know, Satan was alive and well and living on planet Earth. That's an interesting point. Uh, and I think there's something to it. But I think that a lot of that is because of uh, the, I think a lot of it is because of the movie, because the the actual story, I mean, Holzer, the investigator who actually thinks that some weird things happened there, even though they were exaggerated in Hollywood fashion. Um, I guess the story was that um, he was, he, and he talked about this like it was physics, like it was gravity, like it was science. Oh, yeah. um, he said that it was because, you guessed it, the original house, the original site of the house was built on an Indian burial ground. It was built <laughs> on sacred land. And so when they moved the house, like p brick by brick or board by board or whatever, to a different part of town, the haunting stopped. It was that spot. And he, Holzer asserted that George Lutz was possessed by the, uh, the ancient indigenous, um, you know, Native American who was, uh, who reportedly had died and wanted nobody on his, on his sacred land. Um, that was the story that they had, but the movie makes it, um, the movie is like it, I mean, you know, at one point, Murray Hamilton's character, the, the father superior or whatever says, um, uh, says, uh, and not once have we ever heard that something like this was satanic, you know? So that's the first time you really mm -hmm. hear the word satanic, but that plants it in your head for the rest of the movie. And sure. uh, obviously there's no, there's no, uh, you know, there's no reference to an Indian burial ground, which is something that I think Poltergeist. It's the portal to hell. Yeah, which is something that Poltergeist, ground. of course, I think very cleverly. I, Poltergeist, the more I think about this movie in tandem with Poltergeist, it feels like Poltergeist was a, almost a self or a satire of the Amityville horror in some ways that I think they learned, they learned from the, uh, operatic hamminess and too straight, straightforwardness of, um, the Amityville horror, um, when they, when they went in and, and made, uh, and made poltergeist. My, uh, my dad famously calls bullshit on every Indian burial ground story <laughs> because my dad's a full Haida Indian. And he's like, listen, this entire planet is an Indian burial ground at some point. There are yeah. dead people under your feet wherever you walk. So that's a load <laughs> of bullshit. And uh, when he told me that, I was like, you know, you have a point. <laughs> Oh, so disappointing. We need more. <laughs> I tell you. I tell you. Um, Kathy's brother's engagement party. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize this was a thing. I think every time I've watched this in the past, I thought it was a wedding. Yeah. And this time I spent a little more time or attention and found out it was an engagement party. An engagement party that he has to pay fifteen hundred dollars to the caterer for. For Good a house, and you could buy a house for eighty grand or a hundred grand with fifteen hundred dollars for a caterer. Tell me uh, about and it. That is such a strange scene. I'm like, does the the ghost need cash or something? <laughs> I mean, why? 
what what is was, he a secret asshole? Yeah, it's just like, oh, hey, what what can I do? Oh, I know what I can do now. <laughs> That's right. I, you know, it's one of the interesting. I actually listened to just a few months ago, coincidentally. Um, I listened to a podcast, uh, the Faculty of Horror, the one that's done by the uh, by two of the women that are involved in Rue Morgue magazine. I think oh, okay. Alex nice. West and Andrea Subasati. It's a great podcast, and they talked about the Amityville Horror in the context of being the ultimate um, real estate fear film, <laughs> the ultimate real estate horror film. Because basically, nice. it's like it's like a scarier, more demonic version of the Money Pit, that old Tom Hanks movie. You know, <laughs> the house to see. You know, when the toilet's belching up, it, it's so funny because in the movie, in in the Amityville Horror, when the toilet is like belching up all this inky black goop and it's just not stopping, um, uh, Margot Kidder, uh, Kathy Lutz is pretty non-plush she's annoyed but it's not like she's it's not like she's shooting out of bed and screaming they shot her in the head right. like she does when she wakes up from one of her dreams she's just like oh damn it it's spitting up inky black whatever and that obviously could be not in the least bit satanic that could just be crappy pipes or pretty bad pipes and things going on god knows what those people in that yeah. house were eating oh, yeah god, except there was there was oil, so uh, oh, I mean, but when, how <laughs> the value just went up in this house. Well, <laughs> I'm like that. That stuff was so viscous and black yeah. that any normal person would say we should probably have this tested and see what's going on yeah. here. Call You'd a think. plumber, maybe. Shall we give Something. that a shot? <laughs> well, so with that going on, with the with the money being going missing and all of this stuff, um, I have had money go missing and I've had bad shit happen to me and uh, all this stuff. And I suppose that if, <laughs> if I were a certain kind of person and I were inclined to believe in this stuff, that maybe I would just start saying everything was, you know, the devil or, or, or something because we all need something to blame, right? When things start sure. going wrong. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> with that in mind, I think we can look at some of the stuff in here and say, mm, it does make me wonder, why was this a part of the story, the $1,500? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah like... I mean, and that's, you know, it's it's funny because I think it's almost like this is, America is the ultimate in consumerist culture and the ultimate in capitalism, and this is our way of exploiting the worst fear that a privileged white movie goer can have, <laughs> which is misplacing 1500 bucks. Well, it's a strange, it's used as a strange vehicle too, because then he writes the check to the caterer. Right. And then his business partner shows up later and saying, well, your check hasn't gone through and you're not signing for all this stuff. It's like, I got to tell you at this point, I don't really need reinforcement that he's losing his shit. Yeah. I kind of get that. Right. Um, but, and then, you know, he takes him out for a beer and everything seems okay. So it's like, what is, what is going on here with this? Another think, weird storyline tangent that I think the whole point of that was maybe um, getting him away from the influence of the house was yeah. all it took for him to kind of snap out of it. Um, the real horror in this film was I'd forgotten that he owns a surveying company, oh. and I, I was a property <laughs> land surveyor for twenty year, two years, and and um, and I I was near suicidal at the end of it. I hated it so much. <laughs> so, so that was that was a triggering moment for me. They're not paying him. He's not paying his people. Uh, you know, can I, 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 the other thing that I found very interesting, which again is something that totally went over my head, is I, am I the only one who saw some strong homoerotic tension between George and his business partner? Uh, I think that I there's a lot. I didn't see that, but. It's t because there's a because when they first when they first meet up, there's all these uh, there's all these little there's all these little implications. I mean, there's the way that 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 the actor, you know, Michael Michael Sachs looks at uh, at uh, George's character at, at Brolin's character. You know, I mean, it just feels like there's, you know, at, at one point they they meet at a bar and I guess George is late. And, um, you know, the Jeff, the Michael Sachs character looks up and is like. Thought I might be stood up. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's another point. And then at the other point, and this gets back to the whole consumerism thing, but mixed with the homoeroticism, there's a scene where um, where uh, 
Jeff comes over and he's trying to get um, he's trying to get uh, George Lutz to sign the checks because he's the business owner. He's he, you know, you need to sign the checks. We haven't paid our guys yet. Oh, and by the way, some caterer is all pissed off because you wrote a check for fifteen hundred dollars that you fucking bounced. And then George is like, you know, he at this point in time, he's not bathing. So he's got like armpit you know, sure, armpit sure. rings and his, and he's been wearing the same goddamn gray sweatshirt for the whole, <laughs> you know, up until this point and all the way in through, through the rest of the movie. And then at one point, George is like, um, well, tell me some good news. And then, and then Jeff, his business partner is like, well, I got you the spotlight for your boat. Uh, and then George all of a sudden like yeah, lights up. It's it like really the consumerist worked. thing comes back, you know, <laughs> oh, you're giving me a thing, an item. And then at that point, um, Jeff's character looks at him. He goes, I'll install it for you. <laughs> and the energy in between these two, between these two guys, I'm, I'm sorry. It's there. Not that there's anything wrong with that, of course, but it's there. Tony, you have convinced me. I, I wasn't seeing this. <laughs> Clearly this, this film... is what happens when you watch the damn movie five times in, yeah, yeah. in a relatively rapid clip. <laughs> I, I think that it definitely straddles the line between homoerotic and super homoerotic. Yeah, I think, so. you're right. I think you're right. And it's, it's also an interesting because it's the only... This is, I'm going to go off on a total movie nerd side tangent for about two minutes. Here. Not you. Um, heavens forbid. <laughs> um, Michael Sachs, the only other significant role I know that Michael Sachs played is he's the lead in George Roy Hill's film version of Slaughterhouse Five. Yeah. He plays yeah. Billy Pilgrim. And he works really well in that movie because there's this kind of placid everyman um, cipher quality to him in that movie. And here it's, it's interesting because he feels, he feels very awkward and clunky. And I'm like, it, it really reflects how much he worked, how much his every man, almost blandness really worked well for the character of Billy Pilgrim, who's, you know, time hopping and sort of more observing what's happening in his life than an active participant in it. And then, you know, trying to play a guy who is an active participant in his life, um, or specifically in his and George Lutz's life, apparently like broke back Amityville or something. <laughs> um, I'm sure that will be produced very shortly. But yeah, there we go. Oh my, no, man, there's no copyright. You can make Amityville anything. Henry family moved into their new home in Amityville, Long Island. It ended 28 days later when they fled the house in terror. During that time, they endured a nightmare of evil, a plague of unnatural, inexplicable and horrifying events, which began when their five-year-old daughter boasted of a sinister new playmate, the Amityville Horror, more terrifying than The Exorcist, because it actually happened. Read it now in pan paperback. Let's talk about Jody, uh, the malevolent, Jody. malevolent pig demon who is apparently also supposed to be the ghost of one of the DeFeo girls. You know, sure. after a half a dozen views, <laughs> sure. I am no fucking closer to understanding that entire arc slash yeah. subplot than Floating I was when I was 12 years old. Yeah. I, it just, it's, it's no clearer now than it was then there's it's so muddled and i mean that's you know it gets back to the whole thing this is a 1979 state-of-the-art amusement park ride you know and so you get and then but then it's also got these it like it's interspersed with all these great like cheesy made for tv bits you know like the whole like car crash scene or the oh, whole yeah. almost car crash scene when the hood flips up on the car that you know that uh father you know delaney you know uh, rod steiger's character is being shuttled around by by the Don Stroud character, the other reverend, right. like absent slashed abusive parenting. Sure. Because they really go out, they kind of go out of their way to kind of show how the dysfunction is going. I mean, there's one point where the little girl is sitting outside the house underneath a window while her, uh -huh. while her brothers are dangling a spider. And she's talking, she's basically talking, she's role playing with her dolls. And she's like, don't be a smart ass. And she's like really tearing into him. She's like berating them yeah. the same way that James Brolin, that, that George Lutz exactly. is berating them, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, every, every third sentence 
that George Lutz's character utters at those children is, God damn it. <laughs> well, I think, though, to to show the influence of the house, because yeah. when we first see him, he's given a real save the cat moment where he's talking about, you know, it'd be nice if they referred to me as dad and all that <laughs> stuff. And, and he wants to be loved. And I think we're supposed to see that he is changing very quickly. Remember, all this stuff is happening within a span of weeks, Thanks. yeah, 28 days total. Yeah, 20 days. Yeah, so, right. you know, all the stuff we've already talked about, what was that, 14 days maybe? <laughs> so we're seeing a lot of shit go on here. And it seems like there should be time between all of this stuff, but there is... It right. can't be according to this story. Well, yeah, you know, and and I mean, as is, it it pulls a cardinal sin in my mind of most horror movies, which is it's almost two goddamn hours long, and it doesn't need to be two goddamn <laughs> thank, hours long. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Tony. And even with that, even with that in mind, the the lack of the lack of characterization feels super rushed. I mean, it's like Steiger's character oh, yeah. goes from like zero to a thousand. After smelling something that doesn't smell good and, you know, having some flies bugging his ass. Right. And then he's like, he's instantly at this operatic, like Italian horror movie level <laughs> hamminess. It's amazing. Yes, very and, but it feels that way because like you said, a couple of weeks are supposed to have gone by. And, and I, you know, I would take the position that I think, I think George Lutz is kind of a prick from the outset. He's just, he, I just, he just strikes me as kind of a dickhead right from the get go. And I don't see him. I mean, I, yes, he wants love, but I also see that almost that could be like a self-absorbed, you know, um, uh, like manipulative needing uh, of gratification of having these, these kids, um, uh, these, these kids, um, like, respect slash worship of him yeah that's a good point i mean my dad was a uh was a grumpy strict kind of guy who you know gave love but was also he was the person i was scared of in the house you know yeah, sure. uh, uh if mom said no um i'd wind my way until she said yes if dad said <laughs> no that was it <laughs> and you know and done. so maybe that's maybe true. i'm looking at this guy and, and projecting my dad onto him who i know is indeed a good person but uh yeah. but but probably you know yelled at me much the same way that george yelled at those kids yeah sure uh, well one of the things that i thought was interesting is i really it, it really it's interesting watching this through the frame watching this movie through the frame of uh 21st century sensibilities because as i'm watching it i'm thinking you know uh the lutzes you know what happens when they move out of this evil house but into another house and George goes back to punching on his wife. Then he can say, this house is haunted too. It's making me do it. It's making me knock you to the moon, Alice, or whatever. I really, it's really, I, I think that it's, you can actually view the movie and you kind of get back to what you were saying about it being a psychological thing and about is this, you know, is a key amount of this happening in the character of Rod Steiger, the priest's head. I'm thinking how much of this is happening in the head of George Lutz. How, you know, is this, you know, has, has this living in this house, has it sort of subliminally, you know, tickled this impulse and, 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 um, and is his, is his psyche finding a way to rationalize and justify him, you know, smacking his wife around and like verbally, if not physically abusing and berating the kids. You can look at it from that whole angle. It's a you, good point. You're giving the movie a lot of credit. I know. I know. <laughs> like, I'm, and this is all, if this they is, thought that yeah. much about the movie, I think it probably would have been. Yeah, I mean, but much it's better. It, and I wasn't thinking of it in terms of it. This is this is how intelligent it's being. I was thinking in terms of this is this is doled out with like TV movie benign yeah. flatness, you know. And so it's and so it's not like. There's, there's no, I, this is the way things were back then. You know, you slapped your woman around to get her in line. You know, that's, <laughs> that's 1979 movie mentality. And, and so the fact that he's like this kind of abusive bastard, I think. Well, so is his friend. Yeah. Oh there's God, that, totally. That there's scene that one in the scene. bar where he just berates his wife. Like <laughs> Jesus, dude. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Lord. I actually, um, <laughs> Yeah, I actually, the, yeah, he's got one key line that he that he belts out that was like, 
that like I I was like oh my god, um, and his girlfriend slash wife is played by Helen Shaver, who is a Canadian actress that I've always had a soft spot for. I've seen yeah, her in a lot of good. stuff. She's a trooper. I think she's a really good actress. I actually think she gives a better performance than this, than Marco Kidder does. I would um, agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah she's um, she's good. She's not in it much, but what she does, she does really well. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, there's some scene. There's one scene where. Um, Michael Sachs's character uh, is like, you know, you sound like some psycho weirdo when she's, you know, elaborating on what could possibly be going on. And then at one point he just yells at her, thank you very much for your cosmic views. Now do me a favor and shut up. <laughs> yeah. <it's> like, <laughs> and I'm like, and, pretty... and, and, and then they just keep going on. It's yeah. an NBD, no big deal. You know, wow. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Things has changed. Nice line reading there. I think you nailed it. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. And it's, what's interesting. I wonder how, I wonder how much this movie, because I see Italian horror cinema in everything, I wonder how much <laughs> this movie influenced and was influenced by Italian cinema. Because there's there's aspects like the score, the the opening theme with that child, like, la, la, lying, is very, sounds very goblin, sounds like, you know, sure. very Suspiria. Uh, and then you have the absolutely over-the-top acting uh I mean, you know, Steiger's performance really belongs in like a Lucio Fulci zombie movie. <laughs> you know, and actually speaking, which Helen Shaver, she's all psychic and shit. And she's talking about the house being built on special land. And she, I kept on thinking as I'm watching her do this and her voice starts changing at one point. She's like, ever right. yeah. she's talking like an orc that's gargled acid or whatever. And then she <laughs> and, and then she I'm sitting there watching her doing this and hearing her do this and thinking, this is so Catriona McCall. This is like this is like her character. This is getting deep dive uh -huh, Italian yeah, yeah. cinema. But she's she's like the leading lady in um, City of the Living Dead, The Beyond. Sure. Very expressive face and very much uh, she's always playing the psychically sensitive women. And Helen Shaver is playing that role only in a mainstream Hollywood movie. Now this is before most of Fulci's like. Big yeah, I was going to say. So maybe this character was an influence on Italian cinema. Who knows? <laughs> That's an interesting thought because this did very, very well overseas. I'm yeah. not surprised. So, yeah. so um, why is it a big deal that George Lutz looks like Ronald DeFeo? I'm not <laughs> entirely certain. Other I mean, than it gives the bartender a nice line or two. I'm yeah, like, no, and, I'm... and I was like, okay, he does. And in real life, he does look a little bit like him also. Yeah. Because every man with shaggy hair and a big beard looks like each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like it's like the twenty first century. It's like the equivalent of the hipster in the twenty first century with his beard and his yeah, you yeah. know, his hipster. So outfits. I'm trying to yes. figure out why this is even a thing. What? Why does anyone care that he looks like him? But and they make a big deal yeah, out of it, especially oh, when she finds absolutely. the newspaper with yeah. the picture of obviously. <laughs> James, James Brolin. Brolin. <laughs> Boy, it looks just like him. Yeah, he really does. I I, I don't know. I Because it, it's a weird association because how much does she learn about what the family did before that? I mean, it's just, I don't know. I, I don't see There's a no, purpose for well, it. Well, and then, it, well, you know, the purpose is that it gives another excuse for a, for a random, you know, curve in the amusement park ride where uh, George <laughs> yeah. Lutz is digging into one of the walls with a pickaxe. And by the time he digs into it uh, through the open hole, he sees a silo, he sees a superimposition of what looks like his face, right? but mm -hmm. not quite, it's not quite his face. And the reason why, in, and this is in the documentary on the DVD is that it's James Brolin's brother. Yeah. I saw that. And I'm like, nice. Cause they wanted to make him look, Looks like similar, him, but, but not different. exactly identical. But why? To what end? Yeah, I guess you. exactly. Is, is, <laughs> there was, is no reason for it. Ronald DeFeo is the one who lived out of all those people. Why would his spirit somehow be in? <laughs> it just Thank makes you. no fucking sense. Yeah. The Although spirit, I will say, the haunting spirit is a rustic old pioneer uh -huh. guy, cover big beard, all that stuff. So he's the one. It's not Lutz who looks like DeFeo. It's Lutz and DeFeo look like the spirit. There and that's you what go. we should all be yes. scared of. <laughs> Speaking of that, um, that tearing into the wall thing, I thought the dog digging at the wall was super effective. Yeah. And, yeah. and yes. bloodying yeah. its paws, trying to get to what was ever, yeah. whatever well, was in there. I thought it was a really good thing. And it's scene. foreshadowing to what happens to the babysitter later, too. Of course, right, right. I mean, it's not exactly... 
elegantly and subtly delivered, but it's foreshadowing. That is a <laughs> really solid scene, and that girl, that actress, Jeez. is fucking giving her all oh, there. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I was creeped out during that yeah, scene. When they, yeah. they kind of react like, uh, well, it's no big deal. I mean, the kid, why didn't you let her out? It's like, this girl over here is freaking the fuck out. Maybe... Maybe something actually happens yeah, exactly. and you might consider something's wrong with your door, at least. <laughs> it's yes. like, that is not a child acting like, I, uh, eh, I just want to have some fun with the Lutzes. You know, right. but I think, I think uh, you know, again, if we, if we want to, if we want to uh, attribute a layer that this movie probably shouldn't get credit for to it, <laughs> um, I found that the babysitter character, yes, yeah, she brings it in terms of the terror and the fear. And she's also every bit as dismissive and borderline abusive to the kids. Oh yeah. <laughs> as definitely. any of the adults. So she's like right in there, you know, don't you back talk me. And I'm like, Oh God, God bless America. Out of bed, you little shit. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It, it is the East coast, you guys. That's true. That, that, this that's is true. A I'm bigger laid back. I'm laid back Northwest guy. So I, I'm not accustomed to, <laughs> and my mother was a saint. She never yelled at me like that. So, <laughs> A uh, humble brag. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if that's what I'm humble bragging about, then uh, I'm well done. I'm yeah. There we go. <laughs> Hi, mom. <laughs> <sighs> You're the greatest. So they. She uh... took me to this movie, by the way. <laughs> My mom took oh, me to geez. every shit horror movie that I begged her to take me to because she was at home with two snot-nosed, bored-ass kids and she had to do something. <laughs> so I'd drag her to a fucking horror movie and then like she'd come out of it shaking her head going, Anthony, I can't believe you made me sit through that. And then a week <laughs> later, I'd have her sitting in a the theater watching the fucking Incredible Melting Man. <laughs> oh, nice. And then uh, it, the cycle would begin anew. <laughs> but I diverge. I, uh, I would say that my mom was that way too in that uh she was actually into scary movies and scary books so we had mm -hmm. stephen king books and mm, sure. stuff in the house and so so it was no surprise to find this book in our house um okay so they break down the wall they find out they have a well to hell in their basement <laughs> and, <A> well to <laughs> hell. and there's the, a t-shirt there amityville horror amityville well to horror. hell it, isn't that what, <laughs> the well to hell isn't that what the, uh, yeah. the hippie girlfriend calls it yeah basically so, um and then, you know, one night, all hell breaks loose. The walls start bleeding <laughs> for some reason. Yeah, I don't know. Um, and the stairs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everyone is under attack, and uh, that is their, their 28th day. They escape. Mm -hmm. I thought there was a, a real nice redemption moment for George when he goes back for Harry. Yeah. And, and yeah. Harry gets all, you know, Harry is obviously learned by example and is a very big dick at first to George, <laughs> decides, fuck you, I'm going to put my fangs in your ass. And then he's like, oh, wait, dude's trying to save me. Okay. Let's go. I, I got the feeling that he just didn't recognize George. And the, and it seemed like, I mean, arguably the dog oh, is the on. best actor in this. At that point in time, he smells George. George has been wearing the same shit. And the dog has a profound, pronounced sense of smell. So that dog fucking knows who George Lutz is. I don't buy that for an instant. I'm just saying Unless that... Unless the black ooze that he's covered with, like, completely masks all smell, even to, you know, super hyper sense-focused dog smell. I'm just saying that there did seem to be a moment, a look on the dog's face where he suddenly realized, oh, it's George. Yeah. Now, maybe yes. he was just acting, but I would say then that he is a very good actor. Yes. It definitely exceeds the Rod Steiger performance by Ladies and Bounds with that one moment. I hear you, man. I hear you. Harry gave a very subtle performance. <laughs> <laughs> Nuance. <laughs> um, and then they take off and everything. Okay, so big question: Do we even like this movie? <laughs> I found it, I found it fascinating and highly entertaining. And I and what was interesting is watching it and contrasting my reactions to it as a twelve year old with my reactions as a middle aged dude watching it. <laughs> um, which is that I can see why on some like superficial goofball level it actually worked and scared me as a kid and i think mm -hmm. it gets back to that sort of implied uh versimilitude that you get from the from that whole made for tv bad reenactment feel that the movie has i you know it was like it was like watching an episode of in search of only the the crappy reenactments are populated by like oscar winning actors and shit so it's very <laughs> surreal you know um, which is something that goes right over your head as a kid. But the thing that didn't go over my head is that it felt very, it felt like I was watching a reenactment from In Search Of. And so for me, 
that mm -hmm. was a little bit freaky. It's like, okay, maybe no matter how goofily this is depicted, it's depicting something that really happened. <laughs> That's a, so, I, that, that take would have helped enjoy the film more. I found, I really want to go in, because I had the weird experience watching The Exorcist for the first time I watched it, freaked me the hell out. Second time I watched it, it bored the shit out of me. And then the third time I watched it, it worked fantastic. So it was yeah. like really strange. So I'm going, maybe that will happen with this one. Because no. we talked about this <laughs> years ago, in our very early version of the podcast. Right. And I'm like, well, maybe I'll like it more this time. Nope. It is... <laughs> It would be helped greatly by a 30-minute trim. Oh, totally. And a few other Absolutely. things. But it's still ultimate, ultimately with... It starts up and it dives right into Rod's scene. You know, it it begins with a bang, literally. Yeah. But then it, the first kind of big scene happens fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Where the first big horror scene happens. And I'm going, okay, maybe it's good. No, this is... It's, it's just boring is the problem. It's, There's, yeah, it's not it's really flabby. It, yeah. it is definitely flabby. I'll, it's not I'll give you that bad in the way an Italian movie can be very entertaining, bad. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly not bad enough to be a Bruno Mattei level amusing. <laughs> and it's not, but it's not good enough to be an omen or an exorcist you know, or anything true. like it, that. It, it, yeah. It sits in that rough, bad world of the worst things films can be, which is boring. I think for for me, I agree. There's a, the, the the middle section just sags absurdly, mm -hmm. but as I as I screw you know shot through it fourth and fifth Fucked. time, <laughs> um, because I am an ex Catholic, so please, <laughs> I will I will put myself. This is probably why I'm a horror fan is because I'm a fucking masochistic ex Catholic. Um, <laughs> but as I'm watching it, I realize that there are. There are peaks in the movie. There sure. are definite peaks mm -hmm. in the movie. And so for me, it became a glass half full thing. Yes, this is flabby as hell, but oh my God, the ham has been uncanned. There you are know? some there are definitely some good moments. Yeah. When, and, and, and if you were to watch if you were to condense and go, hey, here's the twenty five minutes of really good scenes. You get the the priest in the house, you get the psychic in the basement, mm -hmm. you get the um Kids crushing hand is kind of a disturbing scene. You take yeah. all those best moments and you built like a 30, 45 yeah. minute thing. And you say, well, this is what the movie's like. Oh, okay. This looks like a really good, creepy horror film. Yeah. But then you drop in that missing 45 minutes to well, an hour. And, 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 like, and actually, I think huh. the, the other thing that the other thing that I think dampens it considerably is that it is that benign, flat, literal TV look that the movie has. Yeah. Overall, I think that that really dampens it because you think about, you know, one of the other things that happened that, that I was thinking about a lot as I watched it is I was thinking about The Changeling, which is like oh, a year after this movie. And the, that is one of the movie. best. Yes. That is not just one of the best <laughs> horror movies of the 80s. It's one of the best movies of the 80s. It's fantastic. It's film. just a brilliant movie. And part of it is because it narrows the focus mm -hmm. and it lets an awful lot of what happens it's not delivered through dialogue and exposition the way that this movie delivers shit with dialogue right, and yeah. exposition. It, 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 it narrows the focus on one character and it lets you see how that character proceeds through the, the uncanny things that begin happening uh, in this house that he's living in. It lacks the cinematic moments. Yeah. When you talk about being a flat TV movie, it lacks the cinematic moments of the, I think, or, I forgot, she's a babysitter or whatever in The Omen. This is all for you. You've got oh, that Holy cinematic yeah. shot yeah. or the scenes in the exorcist with the priest showing up. You see it's in the poster. It's in everything you do. It's there's, an iconic. Image, there's yeah. those shots. And then um, the red ball in the changeling. Yeah. And it doesn't have anything it, cinematic it, like that. And it screams for and that. It scares, and that's, yeah. you know, it's interesting to think about that because we're also talking about American international pictures mm -hmm. at the time. I mean, this is a movie that had relatively A-list actors, but also oh, yeah. it was American international pictures right before they became filmways and white, right before they completely died out. And, and it's Sam Arkoff's behind it. This is a guy who yeah. like put his production muscle behind like <laughs> attack of the crab monsters for that <laughs> sake. He's coming from that aesthetic. So I mean, we can do it for less, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so he's coming from that aesthetic and also, like you had noted at the outset, which I actually didn't know, it was intended as a TV movie. And it's just, you know, I mean, I, the the one scene, one of the scenes that I really, that is really effective, I mean, it's a cop out because it's another fucking dream sequence, but there's the sequence where um, 
Kathy runs into a room, into like the girl's bedroom. She runs into Amy's bedroom and she mm -hmm. sees George standing over her with an ax. Everything's bloody. The kid's staring wide eyed and kid or, uh, Kathy let's start screaming and then you see the ax coming down on her oh, hand yeah. just as it's starting to split and then boom she wakes up mm -hmm. that that slapped me upside the head that mm -hmm. was a very viscerally effective that was like a grindhouse effective scene yeah. and if the movie you know if you're if you're gonna make it a flat bland ass tv movie give me some moments like that that are gonna club me upside the head mm -hmm. you know that are really going to i mean it's you know makes me think of like moments like that in the new york ripper which i think is another <laughs> oh, which is an italian movie but it's yeah. another movie that's shot with almost a tv made for tv flatness yeah. until you get to like the gore scenes <laughs> and then it's like the gloves mm -hmm. are off um, this movie could have used more moments like that, mm -hmm. I well, think. They definitely were going for it and putting it together. I mean, you go through the list of people that were offered Brolin's role, and it's fairly significant. Yeah. A-list actors at the time, and Margot was right off of Superman. Right. So you had, they were they were looking to do something bigger than I think they ended up being able to make, but yeah. Yeah, the, there's another interesting thing, and actually my girlfriend pointed this out as we were watching it. Um, I, Kathy Lutz's character and Margot Kidder in general in this movie is she's very infantilized in places. The way yeah. she looks, she's got the pigtails. Yeah. At one point, she's dressed in what looks like a Japanese schoolgirl outfit. Yeah. And you know <laughs> this this is not this is a I I find a very charming woman, but they're like they're like making her not grown up, and it's like it's a good point. Why yeah, you know, know if you want an ingenue, cast an ingenue. You know. Um, and I've always loved Margot Kidder. I think she's a great actor. Mm -hmm. um, and there are flashes of good work from her in this movie, but it's so disjointed and it's so patchy, you know, and there are so many times when the actors are called on, you know, or maybe they just decide to take it upon themselves to like be fucking ham on rye <laughs> big time that it, that it kind of offsets some of the like really organic reactions that she gives to some yeah. of the stuff that's going on. Well, she doesn't like the movie. Oh yeah, she, and she definitely hated thinks Brolin this is too. Not one of her good roles. She hated Brolin. I mean, it's you know they're very uh, and again on the documentary that's on the DVD, they're very diplomatic as they talk about it. <laughs> but um, it's obvious that Brolin was a guy who was at the tail end of the studio system, and he was, I'm going to learn my lines. I'm going to do everything exactly point by point as the director and the screenwriter have come to a consensus, I'm going to do this. And then she would breeze in and she'd be wanting to improvise. Uh -huh. She'd be wanting to be the free spirit. She'd like, I just like to, you know, go wherever the role takes me, wherever I feel I need to go. You know, that sort of, that sort of philosophy. And so when you get like this, yeah. you know, hardline old school <laughs> guy, and that's the other thing, there is no romantic chemistry between these two people. Zero. None. Oh, not at Zip, all. Zilch. And there's one point where she's like doing stretches and she's in like this negligee and it's just barely concealing the all together. And you're like, wow. And he's, <laughs> and he's like, basically he's, he's treating her like she's, you know, like, like he's a, you know, a Grand Central Station, you know, fucking uh, tr train terminal guy announcing the schedule. He's bored as fuck <laughs> by this rather attractive woman wearing almost nothing and coming on to him in a big way. Oh, God. <laughs> and can we talk about the the uh, the uh, not quite measuring up scene that happens? Oh, the, right. uh, I need Viagra in my uh, life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it happens to everybody. Not to me. <laughs> right, well, you know, that's what every guy says in a movie and that's afterwards. Thing, of course, I'm 12 years old. That totally went over my head. Sure. You know, when I saw it, but this time I'm watching it, I'm like, wow, that's kind of brutal, you know? <laughs> and it goes to feed into why you've got this whole cesspool of dysfunction going on. Because he's coming from a psychological as well as a sexually stunted standpoint. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> the next people who moved into the house. <laughs> Change the fucking Jim and Barbara subject. Cromarty bought the house for $55,000 in March of 77. Holy shit. Wow. Um, they rejected all claims of the locks, the doors, the windows being broken. I mean, that whole claim of the 
the door being blown out and everything. They're like, <laughs> this is clearly the door that has been here the entire time this house has been built, yes. and it is still here. Um, they also said that the red room was a small closet in the basement and would have been known to the previous owners of the house because it was not concealed <laughs> in any way. <laughs> and then the claim that uh, the house was built on a site where the Shinnecock Indians had once abandoned the mentally ill was rejected outright by the Shinnecock tribe. Oh, shit. And they said, no, that that was never there. See, now, now you're getting into what I was saying at the very beginning. Oh, the let's world talk about of what this movie devastated me as a kid because yeah. I was all in on, oh, man, it's real. I got to see this. I got to find out what's going to happen. <laughs> and the Lutz had appeared, I think, on the Today Show or the morning, whatever yeah, it would have yeah. been at that time. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm like, I've got to watch this. And they don't outright say it's BS because I think partially because they were under lawsuit consideration at the time. But they basically say, we made it all up. Right. And I remember watching it just being devastated by this movie. It's like, what? You guys lied? There is no Santa Claus. God damn it. Yes, exactly. Well, Eric, uh, I told you the, the first year I went to um, that horrifying convention mm -hmm. over on the East Coast, George Lutz was a speaker there. Oh my and God. I was like, oh, cool. So I went, sat in the panel. It was packed. Mm -hmm. And he, he basically came out and said, look, a few weird things happened there, but you know, we made the whole thing up. And, um, and then, oh, yeah. you know, at the end of it, any questions, all these hands shoot up. So the well to hell, how <laughs> big was that? And uh, this stuff. And he, he was just kind of, um, it felt like that William Shatner Saturday night live skit where, where he was just looking at the guy going, there was no well to hell. And, oh, all right. And then the next question was something about, you know, the haunting and, and, I was like, these people do not want to hear that this yeah. is not real. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of that around this movie. There's a lot of, no, no, it definitely happened. It's like, yeah, mm, no, I've, no, I've got some other info here. Um, no neighbors reported anything unusual during the time that the Lutzes were living there. <laughs> uh, police officers are depicted visiting the house in the book and the film, but the records show that the Lutzes did not call the police during the period that they were living there. Oh, wow. <laughs> and the Lutzes went on to live a relatively normal life afterwards. Um they divorced in the late 80s. Kathy died of emphysema in 2004, and George died of heart disease in 2006. Oh. Have, have we got a little bit along those lines, too, with the lawsuit? Did you? Pull yeah, I've got back? some other stuff in here. Did you know that Ronald DeFeo died in March of 2021? No. That while well, we were all thinking about other things, yeah, uh, it didn't really come up. Yeah. I've got some really interesting stuff from him sure. here. Um, so his story of hearing voices was pretty much bullshit. And it was built on what his lawyer was telling him to do. Claimed that the voices were in his head and the two of them would become very wealthy from book deals and such. Mm -hmm. His lawyer was William Weber, who would then go on to admit that he, George, and Kathy Lutz concocted the whole story over several bottles of wine. So, <laughs> yep. so DeFeo's lawyer is the lawyer that sits down with George and Kathy Lutz and comes up with this, this entire story. Then they're getting sued because now well, he's suing the Lutzes yeah. because um, for breach contract when they d decided to go with Jay Anson instead of the writer he had lined up for this. So probably could have um, milked this for a lot more. The Lutzes made very little money off of this whole thing out, yeah. out of the whole Amityville horror uh, franchise. I, I think that I read something like they might have made $300,000 out of everything. Wow. Couldn't have we bought their house, I well, guess. Of course, of <laughs> how many decades, you know? Well, and um, towards the end there, George Lutz tried to uh, copyright the the Amityville Horror name. Oh, okay. But because, like I said, because it's, you know, a matter of public record, yeah. that's why you're not seeing Amityville Horror 13th, the shark Amityville. You're just seeing Amityville, Amityville shark, shark because... You can't copyright the name of a town. Amityville in the hood. Right. Um, yeah, I've got some some cool information, though, here oh, that okay. I dug up. So apparently the, te the detective on the scene testified that he believed there were two killers because it's not just one gun that was used in these murders. Oh, so you're talking about the oh, actual wow. yeah. killings. Okay. So uh, two guns were used, and that he thought that that would explain why the killer would have had time to kill everybody before waking them up instead of going from room to room in this gigantic house and yeah. nobody waking up. Uh, this then 
gets into some crazy stuff. Now, we can just... Are you sure? I'm Sorry to interrupt, but are you sure you don't want to save this for the episode on Amityville 2? <laughs> well, I thought that this was... Uh, you know, we can talk about that then, too. But I thought this was so interesting because it really goes to show... DeFail, obviously, some mental issues there. Right? I think if <laughs> yeah. you're going to kill your entire family, we can go out on a limb and say you're crazy in some way. Uh, in 86, he changed his story and claimed that his sister Dawn killed their father... And then their distraught mother killed all of the siblings before he killed his mom. (laughs) He says that he took the blame because he was afraid to say anything negative about his mother to her father and his father's uncle out of fear that they would kill him. His father's uncle being Peter DeFeo, who was a capo regime in the Genovese crime family. Oh, my. (laughs) Yes. So that's interesting. That's 86, right? In 1990, DeFeo asserted that Don and an unknown assailant who fled the house before he could get a good look at him killed their parents. And then Don subsequently killed their siblings. He said the only person he killed was Don and that it was by accident as they struggled over the rifle. Then in 2000, he claimed that he had committed the murders with his sister, Don, and two friends out of desperation because his parents had plotted to kill him. DeFeo claimed that he and his sister planned to kill their parents, but then Don murdered the children in order to eliminate them as witnesses. He said that he was enraged on discovering his sister's actions, knocked her unconscious onto the bed, and shot her in the head. Police found traces of unburned gunpowder on Don's nightgown, which DeFeo proponents allege proves that she discharged a firearm. So, wow. Yeah, yeah. some weird, crazy stories. Uh, the judge in all of these has basically said, I don't buy it. <laughs> But there is one really interesting thing here. In 2001, a judge unsealed the remainder of the Weber versus Lutz court files. And what was unsealed was the simple affirmation of the Catholic priest, played by Rod Steiger, uh, who testified under oath that the events described in Jay Anson's book never, ever transpired. (laughs) I've got a couple weird notes that are movie related. I mean, really weird. How about this one? Elsa Raven, the real estate agent. Yes. Her first film was The Honeymoon Killers. Oh, wow. So she got to work with Martin Scorsese for one week. Because <laughs> he shot one week on oh, that film. that's right. And um, then somebody else, and then two other directors finished it off. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so that's like, oh, that's an interesting one. Or Jay Anson, the writer of the novel, also wrote a series of um, movie called Movie Making, which were basically promotional material for films in the 60s and early 70s like eight or 10 minute little pieces. He did one for Oliver, <laughs> the Green Whoa. Beret, and Triple X movie, Lolly Madonna. Oh my. <laughs> so funny. Uh, what else weird shit happened? Um, the, I, just, I don't, I did not realize this. So I was reading it, that it was not shot in the Amityville house. No. At all. It was because they wouldn't let him. City wouldn't yeah. let him shoot. That, and also, I at least Hans Holzer in the commentary says that it wasn't photogenic enough. Uh, this wasn't nice large <laughs> and, and photogenic enough for them to actually use, so they had to basically, you know. The, I, I, I forget if it was a different house or if they just built it from whole cloth, but yeah. Right, yeah. I, I would imagine that. I mean, houses yeah. were smaller. Absolutely. In the 70s, 60s and 70s, they were... Yes. Much smaller footprints. When I was looking up the uh, the sales history of this, uh, the house is on Zillow. You can you can look. Oh, is it really? Yeah, you can look through all the pictures on it, and it's it's a big, beautiful house. I mean, man, it is cool looking. I would sure you know you do a lot of work when you buy that house to make sure it does not look like a rundown Mm -hmm. house. Right. So um, I have a couple of little bits of trivia about some of the actors that are in the movie that I, we haven't really touched on, and if you guys are about and to. And the Italian horror movies they've been in? <laughs> no. Unfortunately, oh, right. no Italian horror cred. Um, Natasha, <laughs> Natasha Ryan, the little girl who plays Amy, oh, the Lutz's yeah. daughter, uh, was actually kind of a go-to kid in peril in the 70s. She was a regular on the Days of Our Lives soap opera for quite a few mm-hmm. years, and she is the kid in peril in Kingdom of the Spiders, who is rescued by William Shatner. Oh, he is? Oh, wow. wow. 
Uh, <laughs> and uh, one of the Lutz boys is played by a child actor named Mino Pellucci, who oh, also that was... sounds kind of Italian. Yes, it does. <laughs> although he's an American Italian kid, if I I, I believe yeah. it's pronounced Mino Pellucci, <laughs> I would not be surprised. Um, and uh, he was actually in the TV series, the brief TV series version of um, the Bad News Bears. Oh. And he was also the second, he was the lead opposite John Eric Hexum in the TV series, and I forget the name of the TV series, that the two of them were working on as time travelers when during uh, one of the um, onset days, Hexum put a gun to his head joking around oh. and pulled the trigger because, oh, look, this is, this. there's there's no bullets in this. And then, of course, what was that show? Uh, um, it was something like, Time just travelers, or oh, oh, he was just, the kid was okay. just a, he was just a character that was op opposite John Eric Hexum's character, and I think they had only shot like an episode or two before Hexum had that horrible accident. But uh, yeah, Mino Pellucci, hmm. one of the Lutz kids in the movie. Um, I don't know if he was there when John Eric Hexum killed himself by accident, but hmm. a little bit of little footnote in yeah. movie trivia history for you guys. Uh, I've got one little piece here, uh, James Brolin. Took less money up front, but with a promise of 10% of Whoa. the gross sales after its release. Oh, yeah. After the movie became an unexpected blockbuster, he eventually received about $17 million. <laughs> if adjusted for inflation, that would be equivalent to a little over $55 million. Oh, for his nice job. Nike in this movie. James yeah. Well he, played. He didn't want to take the movie. Uh, yeah. He thought it was, you know, a load of bullshit. Basically came right out and said, uh, you know, he met with George and Kathy and everything. And afterwards he was like, they seem very nice, but this is a load of bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he talks in the, in the documentary that's on the DVD, he talks about how Lutz was, he was like, yeah, you know, George Lutz was a great salesman. He could have sold you sand, you know? <laughs> uh, and that's his, that's his very diplomatic way of saying, yeah, this guy, this guy, yeah. this guy is charming, but he's full of shit. Yeah. He came out after, a little while later after the movie was done and tried to say that he had, he wasn't able to get any jobs for like two years because his character was so mean, but he actually had Night of the Juggler in 1980, so High good. Risk in 1981, and two made for TV movies in the, in the two years following. So he had no problem getting hired. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that guy is, uh, is one good looking piece of man meat. Sure. Yes, he is. Except for all the, you know, the uh, no sleep and the freezing look and everything that he's got going on in this. But and when, the lack when of first, hygiene. Yeah, yes. when we first meet him, though, I'm just like, boy, that is a man right there. Yeah, he's like what every he's like what everybody wants God to look like in movies. He's got the flowing mane and the beard, perfectly handsome dude. Yeah, I you know it's I, it's funny because his his grouchy deadpan performance actually works in favor of the character most of the time, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and there's a guy, Night of the Juggler, man. That's a, so that's good. a really underrated. I haven't seen that in ages. I love that movie. I just saw it recently for the oh. first time, and, and it is really, really good. Get a look at nice. it. Um, okay, so we're winding up. Tony, tell us what you got going on. You've got another podcast that you do, right? Uh, I work with uh, three good friends of mine on a podcast called City of Geek, uh, and we just recently did our first episode in almost two years. Um, I also have something on the back burner that I'm hoping to move to the front burner very soon that um, I may receive some moral and technical assistance from somebody at this table, here, <laughs> which I'm looking forward to. Um, but uh, I, I don't want to talk too much about that because I feel like it's jinxing myself if I do. Um, but yeah, uh, artisthome.org. I cover Northwest music and I love getting on the bully pulpit for local bands and artists. Uh, and the sunbreak.com. I get to write about uh, new movies most of the time. Uh, and I try to, again, uh, do an emphasis on Pacific Northwest films and filmmakers. And also, if you do come out to Crypticon, you'll probably see Tony interviewing some of the lar the bigger guests. He does probably. amazing interviews. That will really, thank really you. good. Thank you. I love doing it. And I, I, you know, spending 45 minutes of undivided time talking to a childhood hero or a childhood <laughs> yeah. crush, what's not to like about that yeah. in a room full of people who are totally into the same thing? Yes. That's one of the things, many things I love about Crypticon is it's... It's brought us together, and it enables me to do that every year. 
Eric, uh, cool. talk a little bit about Crypticon for the people who don't know what he's talking about. Yeah, it's a horror convention here in Seattle, and uh, Crypticon Seattle. Oh, look at that. Uh, it happens at the end of May, and it's down at the Doubletree SeaTac. So if you fly in, just walk across the street, and you're there. And Eric, you run the film festival yep, for Crypticon. The film festival there at this point, still going through the submissions. We're at closing in on the most submissions we've ever received. I'm looking forward to seeing what comes together from it. Yeah, me too. And of course, uh, if you're here, you're either a huge fan of the Amityville Horror and you found us that way, or you are following Eric and I over from our regular podcast of Strange Eons Radio. Uh, so that you can find us there every week. This podcast is going to be less structured than that as yes. far as the time goes. Yeah. I think that this will probably come out once a month, maybe, yeah. because, you know, we watch a lot of movies for that podcast and uh, these movies are are going to get less pleasant to watch <laughs> as we continue on. So yeah, I don't feel yeah. like we need to watch an Amityville movie a week Gotta or anything like that. Got to crank up our, our cheese <laughs> abilities more. But uh, <laughs> that's it then. I really, really want to thank everybody who listened. And please, you know, reach out if you like this. Let us know how you felt about it. And uh, we'll be back. You know, you'll we'll let you know when the next episode that's is right. coming out. Don't worry. Tony. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us yes. for this. As always, gentlemen, an absolute pleasure and an honor to uh, bullshit over cinema with the two of you. <laughs> and we'll get you back. I want to make this um, yeah. something where we have a, you know, a different guest every week, but it doesn't have to be like, we'll never see you again. We'll get you back for another oh, okay. one of these. Definitely. Um, and probably for more than you want, if, <laughs> if we're being honest. <laughs> uh, I don't know if we, you know, I'm, I'm bummed that I'll be missing out on the uh, Amityville 2 podcast because uh, <laughs> that's actually probably my favorite Amityville movie. Oh, nice. I think it's it's really no better quality wise than any of the others, but I think it has a blunt force efficacy that um, <laughs> that that works. And also, speaking of Crypticon, mm. many years ago, one of my first interviews of Crypticon was Diane Franklin, the leading oh, lady from Amityville. There too. we go. There we yes. go. But yeah, anyway, she's great. Um, that is that is for another episode. That is for another rotating guest, and I will be listening raptly to that episode. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Yeah. We'll see you next episode. Ciao. See ya. Transportation and other considerations for Strange Eons Radio produced by Pan Am Airlines. When you think of traveling, think of Pan Am. You can't beat the experience. Guests of Strange Eons Radio stay at Econo Lodge Ever. It's an easy stop on the road, if you know what we mean. Strange Eons Radio is recorded live in front of a studio audience. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a positive review on your favorite podcast app. Sit, Ubu, sit.